Jai Hind, welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. As you can see, I have with me a special voice on Kashmir and the issues that surround that region. Ms. Arthi Tiku, thank you so much, ma'am, for joining me. And I look forward to hearing and learning from you about that particular region that I think has been hidden from us for a long time. Well, Adi, uh, uh, Kashmir has always been there. It's just that many Indians either were too busy in their struggle for a better life or the media which basically created narrative on nation building just chose not to look at Kashmir, just chose not to look at the uh, foundational uh, region of Indian civilization. And that's why a lot of Indians perhaps do not understand the significance of Kashmir history. They do not understand the significance of the, uh, not just Kashmir, but entire region of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. But one can, one can certainly say that in the last <clears throat> eight years, a lot has changed and a lot is being now dug out from the buried history of Jammu and Kashmir, buried history of India actually, because a lot of authors, a lot of history which was not touched upon, which was completely ignored and neglected uh, by design actually, is now coming to the forefront. And we have authors like Vikram Sampath, we have authors like uh, Shunalika Kaul, we have many other people in media, in academia, and now also even in cinema because Kashmir Files, uh, a movie which ought to have been made in the last 30 years, finally saw the light um, <clears throat> only just last year. So in a way, uh, what I'm really saying is that when I say that there was a concerted effort to keep the history of Kashmir hidden, concealed from everyone. There was a certain design behind it. It was a political design. But also, uh, if you look at our own colonial past, a lot of us did not really understand where we came from, who were the perpetrators of violence in India. We did not understand who were the victims and who were the tyrants. But now there is a sharpness in the discourse in India because a lot of us, like as I mentioned a few names, a lot of us basically spent our time and energy and made efforts to find out who we are as a people, as a civilization, as a community and as a nation. And that's why you will now see, you will now see, you know, Lalata Ditya, for example, uh, King Lalata Ditya is now being talked about because somebody made an effort to bring out the true history of Kashmir to the mainstream. Uh, now, if your question is that, why was there a concerted effort or a design or even a conspiracy to hide all this, you will have to understand the colonial history of India and you will have to understand the circumstances in which India and Pakistan were partitioned and the context in which the idea of Pakistan germinated in India. The idea that India uh, is not one nation that India is not a coherent you know, civilization or a nation. The colonial project divided people of India along not only caste, but communities, ethnicities. Um, but if you really look at the literature of India, ancient India, medieval India, there were, no, there were not divisions as such because there was no concept of boundary. There was no concept of 
you know, uh, the, the, there was no concept of visa, passport, or citizenship. Therefore, all these, all these, you know, Western templates that we now use to identify a state or a nation or a civilization, they are just modern tools, modern mechanisms, and modern definitions, which we are imposing on, on a civilization which is more than 5,000 year old. So uh, I'm sorry if I'm drifting away from the uh, question, but... Uh, no, not at all, ma'am. What you're saying is very profound and please continue. Yeah, so the, the point is that Kashmir has always been part of that civilization uh, and Shunalika calls a book uh, the making of Kashmir, early Kashmir, uh, which is actually a review of Raj Darangani gives us uh, gives us an idea about how Kashmir has always been part of not just uh, you know geography but also our cultural benchmarks, our cultural parameters, and it has a very significant significant place in in our cultural identity, in our uh, civilizational identity. So uh, the issue is that why did we not why did we not go into it why did we not read about all these uh, aspects of our identity in schools or in our colleges or uh, in universities? Well, because uh, to begin with, the way India as a nation was created with how you know half of the territory actually being given to to pakistan and creating two nations out of one uh, can actually give you the insight into why we have been very selective about our own history hmm. first that when pakistan was created it was created on the basis of a very regressive idea that Hindus and Muslims cannot live with each other, that coexistence is not possible, that Muslims in themselves are a different nation. And that is absolutely a bizarre, bizarre uh, idea because earlier, uh, before all these, you know, Western templates of identity, that's not how that's not how people used to think or people used to live, whether it was Kashmir or any other part of India. Your geography, your uh, the, the, the environment in which you were born and raised defined your culture and it defined therefore your identity. But with the idea of this two nation theory, you basically sowed when I say you, I mean to say that the British sowed the seed of a separate identity uh, from, uh, from the Indian identity, which is rooted in geography, which is rooted in culture, which is rooted in a certain philosophy. And <clears throat> that, that created this you know, notion that Muslims ought to have a separate state and a muslim majority region ought to be to ought to have a special status that is why jammu and kashmir was given a special status within the constitution of india that itself cemented or calcified a separatist identity within uh, within the union of india where all identities, you know, you remember while growing up, while we were getting educated under NCRT uh, curriculum, all of us were made to believe that there is unity in diversity. But when it came to Kashmir, uh, the idea was that, yeah, unity in diversity is fine, but outside the boundaries of Jammu and Kashmir. So in a way, the idea of Pakistan was sustained in JNK. And therefore, our academics and our media, our philosophers, thinkers, they became 
willful participants in perpetuating the idea of Pakistan within India, the idea of an Islamic state within India, the idea that Hindus and Muslims are two separate yeah. identities uh, and two separate nations. And therefore, this, this Muslim nation within the pluralistic nation of India, uh, they ought to have uh, they ought to have a separate identity. They ought to have a separate uh, status. They ought to be treated differently. They ought to be treated with a special um, status. And therefore, the Indian Constitution actually was in contradiction with itself. Because on the one hand, outside JNK, everybody was an equal citizen and an equal participant in the democracy of India. But JNK was special because it was a Muslim majority state. <laughs> so, so that is why that is why our academia, our intellectuals, our media, they left, they kept the the history of Kashmir concealed. We were never taught why, in fact, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, Kashmir has been the uh, fountainhead of Indian civilization. Ma'am, I must say that's a, you've hit it out of the ballpark <laughs> right there in that answer because at the end of it, that's something I'm personally researching on, is that India, in spite of having different, different religions, um, and it's not now, it's for centuries, by the end of it, and I'm referring a census that was taken by the British in 1891, where almost 20 lakh Sikhs living in the northern part of India referred themselves as Hindus. Uh, almost about 3 lakh Muslims staying in Gujarat referred to themselves as Mohammedan Hindus. Uh, the idea of Hindu was early Persian writings and even middle age Persian writings talks about anybody who stays across the Indus. So the whole Hindu thing has been twisted today. And that's amazing. I think you've pointed it out beautifully in your answer. May I also ask you another question about the whole concept of Kashmir? Is the fact that I just said it, as a matter of fact, Kashmir, uh, when that word is mentioned, it encompasses in our minds the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, the erstwhile state, and today the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and the Union Territory of Ladakh. The funny thing about is that is, of course, Kashmir is a smaller region of that uh, area, but that smaller region kind of dominated the entire politics of that entire state till now, uh, till probably the bifurcation happened and, you know, the 370 and all this stuff and where today we are talking about these things. How do you see an effect of something like that, which took place on that entire region? Yeah, well, <clears throat> that has been the tragedy of Jammu and Kashmir, that Kashmir Valley, which is uh, geographically a very small region, small valley in the, in the huge state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which, uh, was now, which is now a union territory and earlier, in the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir, Kashmir was completely insignificant geographically if you look at the landmass. Uh, even after JNK became a union territory and Ladakh is also a separate union territory now, even then if you look at the, the land where Kashmiri speaking people live, it is even uh, smaller than even, even the the Kashmir Valley itself, you know, because Kashmir Valley also has upper reaches uh, mm -hmm. where you have Gujar and Pahadi people who do not speak the Kashmiri language and who do not identify themselves as Kashmiri speaking. But uh, history, history has placed, you know, Kashmiri speaking in a very, you can say, advantageous position one because because uh, because in the 1930s while uh, jinnah was leading the muslim league movement and uh, jammu and kashmir was 
under an, you can say autocracy um, because it was it was under the dogra rulers kashmiri muslim population kashmiri speaking uh, pe population uh, the muslim population especially uh, they mm. <clears throat> they had their own relationship with the the british colonial authorities <laughs> the maharaja of jammu and kashmir at the time had a difficult relationship with both uh, the british authorities as well as the mass movement uh, of the congress party at the time um, because it was uh, mostly headed by pandit jawahar lal nehru and that created a very you can say a very complex situation for jammu and kashmir which was if you consider if you if you look at the entire state of jammu and kashmir before 1947 um, you will obviously consider pakistan occupied kashmir gilgit baltistan and all of it was yes muslim majority state but at the same time the kashmiri speaking population with respect to other muslim communities in jammu and kashmir were uh, a very marginal community uh, you look at you look at the muslims in pakistan occupied kashmir you look at muslims even in jammu region at the time uh this is uh, i'm talking about before 1947 <laughs> muslims in meerpur muslims in uh, in kargil if you consider if you look at all the muslim demographic of jammu and kashmir before 1947 uh in fact i would really appreciate if you after you edit this program you should put up the maps of jammu and kashmir and show the regions uh, that i'm referring to and also the demographics the data of the demographics sure. and yeah and when you consider all of that kashmiri muslim population was insignificant but the fact that um, sheikh mohammad abdullah had the backing of the british for the moment that he was leading against maharaja hari singh uh, if you also remember that there was a, a glancy commission set up by the british uh, basically against maharaja's rule even though if you compare maharaja hari singh's rule to say nizam of hyderabad uh, maharaja hari singh's rule would come across as a very uh, benign rule and not not something which was really autocratic or which was insensitive towards the the demands of muslims in the state but the way since maharaja had a difficult relationship with the british as well as the congress party of the time uh and kashmiri muslim leadership that is sheikh mohammed abdullah offered himself as uh, you could say you know he had a very good uh, he established a good rapport with both the british and and the and the nehru gandhi uh, leadership of the congress he yeah, sheikh abdullah basically enjoyed a very Mm, you can say advantageous position in the scheme in the larger scheme of kashmir politics which eventually put sheikh abdullah in charge of jammu and kashmir otherwise otherwise there was no vote there was no election which uh, basically would have appointed sheikh abdullah as the chief minister or as the leader of the entire state of jammu kashmir and ladakh now um, your question was that um, sorry i forgot the question what was the question ma'am why is it uh, the dominant factor of kashmir which is you know yeah dominant so 
so that when when uh, basically sheik was leading this movement against hari singh with the backing of both the congress party and the british uh there i think both the british and the congress party saw an opportunity for themselves on the uh, one hand um when uh, the kabali raiders you know uh, launched an attack on jammu and kashmir it was because of sheik abdullah it was because of the backing he had received from the from nehru and it was also with the backing of uh, the british he had emerged as a leader among kashmiri muslim population and emerged as a leader for uh, not just kashmiri muslim because at one point even kashmiri hindus were supporting him uh, it's a different question that later they saw through sheikh abdullah's political cunningness and they then began opposing him as well but as i was pointing out when the kabalis as you know launched their assault on jnk uh, sheikh abdullah perhaps on the request of the congress party and nehru he he and kashmiri muslim uh, members of the national conference kashmiri pandit members of the national conference they were at the forefront of defending uh, kashmir from the kabalis we uh, if you remember there were there were lots of young men and women of the national conference who made several committees forged several groups and they were countering pakistan they were countering kabalis they were countering uh, the whole um, leadership of muslim league as well so that gave kashmiri muslim leadership as well as kashmir the muslim majority valley even though geographically insignificant it gave uh, them an advantage or prominence that no other community has had that itself you know was a big big um, you can say uh, event which placed them in this position then of course nehru also once maharaja hari singh was overthrown uh, because uh, nehru almost made that a condition that uh, when maharaja was under attack from kabalis and we sent our armed forces our troops our air force to defend the state of jammu and kashmir uh, there was almost it was almost on the condition that maharaja has to uh, step down and basically sheikh abdullah will take over that uh, condition uh, was not a democratic condition that was not uh, a people's mandate uh, it was nehru's will it was nehru's decision which was imposed on uh, the people of jammu and kashmir whether sheikh abdullah had the same popularity in say ladakh or in jammu region is a different question but uh, since uh, he took the reins from maharaja hari singh and then became the ruler uh, that placed you know that placed him in a very powerful position and then from there on be- began the politics of blackmail between kashmir kashmiri muslim leadership and the new delhi leadership and uh, that blackmail continued till 2019 august 5th 2000 uh, 2019 when the government of india nullified article 370 and uh, divided the state into two union territories ma'am you know you've described the history and you've brought out the various subtle features in this entire game very very nicely but one thing that has always given me 
a confusion in my mind as to what was the end game that these guys wanted. Because yes, control, political control, you know, complete this and that and the other. All of this had to be towards a certain objective. I have not been able to put my finger on what the objective was. You had the Hurriyat, you had uh, various JKLF and all lot of other organizations uh, functioning in that place. None of them wanted anything as per se, yeah, public statements apart. But what were their objectives? What was that ground objective that they were looking for? Well, to begin with, let's uh, also uh, accept that when the Kabali raiders launched assault on Jammu and Kashmir, there was a certain objective. And the objective, of course, was that Pakistan uh, considered Jammu and Kashmir as a natural part of Pakistan because Jammu and Kashmir was a Muslim majority state. And the two nation theory on which the partition was effected and implemented in the subcontinent of India, mm-hmm. Jammu and Kashmir, from their perspective, should have gone with Pakistan. Mm-hmm. But it did not happen because all the princely states, mm-hmm. including mm-hmm. Maharaja Hari Singh, had the ultimate authority mm-hmm. to decide whether it wanted to go with India or mm-hmm. Pakistan. And uh, since uh, Maharaja decided to go with India when uh, Kabali's raided Kashmir, uh, this became, uh, you can say, a strategic goal for Pakistan because Jammu and Kashmir also holds, uh, there are several factors. One, Jammu and Kashmir is geographically located at the center of at least uh, three civilizations. Uh, Geopolitics. Yeah. The Indian civilization, the Islamic, uh, you can't really say Islamic civilization because Islam is not a civilization. Islamic stronghold. You can say Arab imperialism, uh, Arab, uh, you know. So on one hand, Arab imperialism, on the other hand, the Chinese imperialism and then, of course, Kashmir's uh, history, which is the, uh, as I said, it's the fountainhead of Indian civilization. But unfortunately, geographically, it is located between these three um, big global centers, global, uh, you know, civilizations, or you can say global powers. Now, uh, when... uh, you are referring to, you know, what was Hurriyat's goal or what was the goal of separatists, what was the goal of soft separatists in Kashmir. So you have to first uh, acknowledge that there, that in 1947 itself, Kashmir became the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Uh, and thanks to the, the, the British colonial, colonialists, who decided to make it a battlefield because uh, to begin with the whole idea of uh, the partition, the two nation theory, it was such an ill-founded idea. It was absolutely bizarre and um, unrealistic, but uh, that's how the British ruled the world by dividing people, by creating uh, nations out of nothing. They drew lines, whether in Middle East, whether in Africa, whether in India, they drew lines and they drew boundaries, they drew borders between people and established their uh, their idea of uh, the nation state. Now, that apart, the next thing was that uh, since Pakistan could not take control of Jammu and Kashmir in 47. They occupied one part of it with with the help of the British, by the way. Mm -hmm. Pakistan occupied uh, Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan are in Pakistan today, under Pakistan's occupation today, because the British uh, army at the time sided with 
I sided with uh, with Pakistani, sided with, in fact, Jinnah and the Muslim League and the Pakistan Army at the time, which was essentially the British Army, and sided with them, with their vision, with their goal, because they wanted to leave a conflict amidst uh, two of its, uh, not two, but basically its former colony, which is India, and out of its uh, colony, it had created two big colonies, that is, Pakistan and India. And I, um, it, this might offend many people that I am saying that uh, even in 1947, when we thought that we had been freed, I'm still referring uh, India as a colony of the British, because they left a, they left a conflict in the colony. And this uh, conflict was to bleed, and it did bleed India uh, for the next 75 years. And perhaps we don't know where, uh, what more. will happen in the future. Yeah, probably more what will happen in the future. But uh, that uh, essentially uh, means that we did not really uh, get complete freedom. We did not get... Uh, the liberty that we had fought for our founding fathers of the Indian Republic had fought for. Now, that aside, in the last 75 years, they attempted several times to capture the rest of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, Pakistan army launched uh, 1965 war, 1971 war and 1909 uh, Kargil War. And mm -hmm. India responded, uh, retaliated, and uh, retaliated successfully against all the incursions, against all the assaults and invasions. And uh, we neutralized, we neutralized all those attempts. But in the meantime, they, in the late 80s, they, began uh, experimenting with proxy war, which was a conventional war. And with that, they resorted to guerrilla warfare with Islamic Jihad and uh, began experimenting with the idea of mobilizing a Muslim population of Kashmir using Islam. And so the Islamic uh, terror project, which began in the 80s, uh, was again, the only reason for that project was that uh, Hurya mainstream or soft separatists, all these actors were looking at only one thing, which was essentially wresting control of Kashmir from India. And... Uh, making it part of Pakistan, which is uh, which continues to be a colony of, uh, you can say, uh, today Pakistan army, in fact, I have always said that it's a mercenary army mm -hmm. and it will, it will always, uh, it will always fight for the highest bidder. Whosoever puts the highest bid uh, Pakistan army will um, happily serve them and happily uh, fight for them. And that is why Pakistan is not either, it's not a free agent or a free state. Uh, it is a client state. Uh, and it will always have masters. It will always have uh, either the backing of the West or the Chinese and uh, of course the arabs as well and depending on what the geopolitics of the world is pakistan will be in alignment with uh, the winner to contain india with the winner they will be in alignment with uh, the winner to harm india now in you will say what were the what were the real objectives first of all uh, Jammu and Kashmir is also a source of water um, for Pakistan. Uh, three major rivers uh, come from Kashmir, Indus um, and then Jhelum. Uh, 
and uh, the third one. Uh, it's a novel. Yes. Yeah. So, so three big rivers come, uh, you know, which uh, whose water is being used by Pakistan are uh, they come from Kashmir. So that is one. Second, uh, as I said, Pakistan army is a mercenary army. Uh, they would they would always like to serve the interests of their paymasters in the uh, for a long time we have known that in fact since its inception as i said that um, uh, jinnah muslim league they had the backing of the british and pakistan after its inception became an ally of the west it became an ally of the united states of america and with that, <clears throat> uh, with that, uh, basically, uh, Pakistan uh, also would do whatever was whatever was instructed uh, to do. And one of the key key interests for the West, uh, especially the British, was to keep an eye on uh, India because we, if you remember. India was seen as an ally of the Soviet Union and India was seen as uh, basically uh, part of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the uh, United States of America. And they, we were seen as a major ally of the Soviet Union. And somewhere the British did not trust uh, Nehru, the first prime minister of India, to be their stooge or their puppet uh, in, and <clears throat> many would say that uh, Nehru, uh, many people in fact complain and have a lot of criticism against Nehru but uh, and his Soviet uh, socialist policies, his uh, leftist communist view of the world but uh, I often uh, remind myself as a student of history that uh, Nehru and India were a product of the circumstances and the context in which India achieved its freedom from the British. In the British had come as through East India Company, and East India Company was nothing but a monopolistic, capitalistic um, project which took, uh, which basically extracted everything from India and left it uh, by the time the British left we we had lost uh, the economic backbone completely mm. so <clears throat> so when you when when you lash lash out at uh, Prime Minister Nehru or lash out at the decision makers at the time we often forget the hist the context of, of that history uh, so, so the point is that uh, when uh, Pakistan's Pakistan played um, played as an ally of the West, and we were uh, seen as allies of the Soviet Union. Um, in the end, of course, Pakistan was going to do whatever Western interests were in the region. And we should never exclude ourselves, never exclude India from the games that were played during the Cold War between the mm -hmm. Soviet Union and the United States. But often we talk about, when we talk about Cold War, we talk about Vietnam, we talk about Korea, we talk about Southeast Asia, we talk about even uh, Africa, and we talk about Cuba, we talk about Middle East, we talk about uh, Afghanistan during the Cold War, but we never talk about India during the Cold War. So, uh, so during the Cold War, uh, Pakistan basically uh, employed the same tactics that it employed in Afghanistan. Uh, it employed the same tactics in Kashmir, in uh, in Punjab. The whole Khalistan project again was a project which was backed by the West. The Islamist project, Islamic terror project in Kashmir was backed by the West. 
they took uh, they in fact last 40 years they took the same line as uh, as pakistan on kashmir even today uh, many many of not many in fact all the liberal media platforms in the west they take the same line as pakistan on kashmir so that should that we should always remember that pakistan has acted on behalf of its paymasters uh, of course uh, that is not to say that pakistan itself is uh, you know pakistan itself has enough motivation to for enough motivation for uh, perpetrating islamic terror they have enough history uh, of uh, the pre partition era and they have enough uh, history of medieval india where they perpetrated uh, islamist tyranny on the people the indigenous people of india so as it is they are capable of you know tyranny and oppression but uh, in the last 75 years they were backed by the western allies and western powers so to say that uh, what was so the question that what was their objective in the last uh, 40 years or 75 years in kashmir of course it was to rest control of kashmir uh, from india and also of course uh, it was uh, to control the uh, have a control on the resources of jammu and kashmir uh, especially waters which uh, they they are using through indus water treaty but they don't really they don't really have a uh, final or complete control over those rivers mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah Interestingly, you know, it's about a matter of survival, and that's something that you've kind of brought out for Pakistan as well, because water is is a big thing, and they always do crib about it. But uh, the factor of the the West that you've kind of spoken about is interesting because uh, we see a sort of complacence uh, amongst the Western countries about the plight of India. till i would say 2611 actually occurred and everybody said okay now we can't kind of deny this anymore this has to you know somewhere down the line come to a point where uh, this thing but i want to talk to you about the people ma'am uh kashmir is a place of intellectualism even today um people read people write people have been you know doing poetry people have been doing a whole lot of things so when a civilization or a region is influenced by literature you normally find people above daily politic how was it that that whole culture was broken up and thrown out and this whole for the lack of a better word i'm sorry but kachra was actually brought in well exactly the way um, if you look at uh, if you look at afghanistan of the 70s uh-huh. early 70s if you look at uh, if you look at various uh, various muslim countries uh, in the, in the in the soviet bloc oh, okay mm-hmm. in the soviet bloc the muslim countries uh, they had rich literature they had they were talking about they were talking about uh, marxism they were talking and as we know marxism uh, first uh, one of its first uh, fundamental tenets is the denial of uh, god religion. the denial of uh, religion and uh, muslim countries uh, in the soviet bloc they were they were they were they were critically evaluating religion mm-hmm. they were they were keeping religion separate from their public life and that changed after the disintegration of the soviet union that dramatically changed because the western supremacy basically which was uh, propagating the view of democracy uh, propagating uh, the view that people should be allowed to uh, to uh, ma- to basically practice their religion their beliefs their whatever superstitions uh, their culture traditions and customs the way they want uh, 
then it of course changed because uh, if you remember um, it happened in the arab spring also and the moment you give uh, democracy to in countries like in countries uh, in muslim countries uh, you may not end up with having a liberal uh, dispensation mm. yeah Uh, you may invariably find that uh, that the most conservative or the most uh, orthodox or the most regressive elements will come to power and that uh, i'm afraid is uh, that is a natural flaw or fault line of democracy and a uh, democracy you may not necessarily get uh, the idealistic liberal or uber liberal uh, kind of dispensation but uh, and we know that many communities many cultures may not even be compatible with the western idea of democracy they may not be compatible even with uh, and you know sometimes you have to also ask yourself the question that uh, is western democracy the ultimate uh, elixir for everyone it may not be it is it is in fact we know that it is not it is uh, yeah and we also know that um, that uh, when uh, in kashmir uh, from 1947 till 19 uh, uh, you can say early 1980s uh, we did not see we did not see regressive uh, aspects of islamism as much as we saw in the late 80s and then 1990s there was a time when burqa for example the veil in kashmir was used by only old women who you know looked uh, either too tired or did not uh, or had turned you know too fat or just didn't want didn't bother didn't bother to show didn't or women who didn't thought want that, to show their appearance they didn't want to show their their appearance yeah but apparent only because they had turned too old personal were, yeah Fair yeah they used to, yeah so but in the late 1980s when uh, terrorism began so this was like now tyranny tyranny of the uh, islamic movement which began in kashmir now younger women who uh, according to sharia according to the islamic law uh, they they are not allowed to show their face they are not allowed to show their hair because uh, all these are sensuous and sexual uh, you know se- sexual aspects of a woman and therefore need to be uh, protected and prevented from the public view so the this this kind of culture came of course through terrorism through the might of the gun and not voluntarily and not uh, through uh, you know any debate or through a dialogue or through an election process or a, through a democratic process so it was mm-hmm. it was tyranny now <clears throat> again uh, in the 40s and the 50s if you look at the literature of uh, kashmir you will see a uh, lot of satire lot of commentary even in the bhakti period of uh, kashmir you will see uh, there was lot of uh, there was lot of uh, similar literature where you could you you could critically evaluate religion you did not that is why there was this you know the nund rishi uh, kind of poetry the nund rishi is the patron saint of kashmir and he and laleshwari's poetry they were read side by side they were not read uh, separately they were read side by side and uh, 
both Muslim communities and community and Hindu community in Kashmir could sort of look at religion from that prism where you basically had to rise above the indoctrination or rise above the dogma of your faith. Mm -hmm. So Islam, 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 even though had even though had a violent history in Kashmir as well, uh, you know, Sultan Sikandar massacred and highlighted mm -hmm. Kashmiri pundits. And uh, there were several other periods when Kashmiri pundits were brutally persecuted. But then there was also this history when, when uh, you can say intellectuals and academics critically evaluated all those aspects of, of life and religion. And that change, that changed uh, dramatically in the late 80s when especially after the uh, after the disintegration of soviet union and this whole uh, all the muslim countries in the in the region whether it was afghanistan also pakistan started with the backing of the west started uh, islamization of pakistan there was there was a, a concerted effort at radicalizing and mobilizing Muslims within Pakistan. As it is, they were radicalized in 1947. That's why partition happened. And as it is, they had sought a separate state of Pakistan based on their Muslim identity, on a communal idea. But then with Ziaul Haq in power, that radicalization, that, uh, that Islamization was... Um, accelerated and mm -hmm. it was it was strengthened uh, to a point of no return actually it's now almost irreversible in pakistan because uh, you know it's been decades decades of indoctrination and decades of radicalization where you have uh, basically the pakistani state military as well as the mullahs and masjids have influenced and indoctrinated the Indian uh, identity because at the core they're all Indians mm -hmm. uh, they may not they may not accept it they may not say it, but they're all Indians but they have calcified that that radical that fanatic Muslim identity so much that now it is almost irreversible similar project similar similar patterns and trends were seen in Kashmir after 1971 uh, where <clears throat> the people who wrote literature, the people who were in academia, the people who were in influential positions, they also, the, the, the whole Pakistan Islamization project sort of rubbed off on, uh, on the Kashmiri Muslim identity as well because they were always looking up to to Pakistan, they were always looking towards Pakistan because there was that constituency that was this. There was this uh, strong pro-Pakistan element which was always there to begin with, and they they also they also uh, basically got influenced by whatever was happening in Pakistan or whatever was happening in the Muslim world. We have seen that. In the after uh, Iranian revolution, especially, we've seen that the Muslim world has become radicalized. It has become uh, more fundamentalistic. It has uh, had so many conflicts with with almost every other community, and that radicalization has affected Kashmir as well. Uh, so. To expect that the writers, the literature that was once upon a time syncretic uh, or once upon a time would critically evaluate religion and religious practices is uh, no longer there. It uh, is very difficult for perhaps uh, the academia and the media and the intelligentsia to introspect because it's been decades of indoctrination. 
Ma'am, I must say, you know, when you look at a situation and you connect it with history, a whole different picture emerges, and that's the appreciative part about how you're describing this entire thing. Because mm-hmm. one thing that I've noticed in India, and that's something that I hope changes, that uh, there's a generation of us that found history to be a very boring subject. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's something that is yes. affecting our entire narrative and affecting our mm-hmm. entire being, if I may. So. I might, I, seriously, you know, the amount of historical context to explain something of today is mm-hmm. appreciable. Ma'am, I'll come to the end of this interview and ask you a final question. And uh, wherein my point would be that mm-hmm. today we are in a point of correction, right? People expect mm-hmm. it to done, you know, it should be finished. Correction, ho gaya, Article 370 is done. Why are we waiting? That's the, I won't say, uh, I would say insensitivity of thought, okay, Uh, because we expect it to click and on. Now, here is a set of people that probably have been through a lot, of course, no matter the indoctrination and stuff like that, but it's affected those people as well within the valley, within the Jammu region, within the other regions of uh, that, that area is because at the end of it, they had no money, they had no prospects, they had very few opportunities within the place. When they went out into India, they were looked at differently, if I may. And the whole culture was set in to be, let them be. From that to today, an amalgamation, it's not an overnight story, but you being from there, how do you see the amalgamation in the past three years? And I'm not asking for a timeline, but do you see it kind of moving forward in a positive direction? There will be resentments. Let me, uh, you know, add that. Well, uh, first of all, what happened on August 2019 is, uh, is historically so significant that people won't be able to wrap their heads around it because they don't, one, understand uh, mm-hmm. what was at stake. They don't, second, understand uh, that how it was managed and how uh, it was bloodless, how it, you know, how this integration, complete integration of Kashmir with the rest of India uh, you know how it was executed uh, it's something that year in it will unfold in years to come in decades mm-hmm. to come and uh, people will look back at this uh, historical date historical move by the uh, modi government and i have to say that uh, both prime minister modi and home minister amit shah will uh, will will be known uh, I'm making this prediction will be known for this historical decision because it will have a long lasting impact on the Indian civilization for uh, centuries to come. No question. Absolutely. Uh, And uh, the reason uh, for anyone to expect that uh, that this decision was the be all and end all Uh, is, uh, I would say, they don't understand what all it entails, what the decision entails. And it's not something uh, that was uh, closed on August 5th, 2019 uh, itself. It's a a process, but that process uh, began on August 5th, 2019. And this process will take a lot of time, but I can... I can see that it is going in the right direction. Uh, why am I saying that? One, in the last 32 years, apart from all the history that I narrated, apart from all the uh, geopolitical interests of various states, uh, whether it was the British or the American state, uh, you know, or whether it was uh, the interests that developed during the Cold War, interests that developed, that have developed after the rise of uh, the uh, of uh, the Republic of uh, 
uh, after the uh, after the Chinese and I, I sorry I mistook uh, PRC basically uh, and so the interests that have developed geopolitically in the last uh, last uh, 32 years um, between uh, so earlier you know the world the geopolitics of the region was along uh, the cold war cold war mm -hmm. interests of the soviet bloc mm -hmm. and the and the western bloc but in the last 32 years the interests are now uh, shaped along two blocks of the world the chinese uh, bloc you can say and the western bloc and so the fact is that uh, prime minister modi and home minister amit shah and um, insisting on taking both the names because uh, without their uh, vision without their without the execution uh, that was uh, that was needed for this kind of an operation on august two, 2019 uh, it wasn't possible to uh, basically protect or you can say secure Jammu and Kashmir with uh, without you know what what was uh, yeah. uh, 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 you know basically done by by Prime Minister Modi and Home Minister Amit Shah. So the state has been secured, but also the steps that have been taken after august 5th 2019 for example the uh, the land amendment act the domicile you know laws mm -hmm. also the fact that uh, uh, union territories of ladakh and union territories of jammu and kashmir are now two separate union territories also the new land uh, rules which have come into place just two days ago. All those laws and rules have ensured a few things. One, the integration of Jammu and Kashmir without uh, causing mayhem, without causing loss of uh, life. That is one. Second is uh, that uh, Jammu and Kashmir uh, is now like any other part of India, the people of Jammu and Kashmir who were earlier had the access and the privilege and the uh, right to own a property anywhere in India, live uh, anywhere in, in any corner of India and uh, to settle down in any part of India. That right which Jammu and Kashmir people had in any other part of India. Now, other other Indians also have the same right in Jammu and Kashmir. So that is one that was uh, necessary to establish the historical link between Kashmir and the rest of the country. Then second uh, is the fact that several people who had been serving in Jammu and Kashmir for decades they were uh, they had absolutely no rights whatsoever in jnk but for the laws that have come into place after 2019 uh, which includes the domicile law people who served in jnk for uh, up to 15 years or more uh, they can they have an equal right in jnk and as it is as i said anybody can now go and buy land and property in JNK. And mm -hmm. that uh, brings JNK at par with the rest of uh, the country. So, but that is not to say that all the problems uh, have been resolved or JNK is going to be absolutely a peaceful, harmonious state. As I pointed out earlier in my uh, uh, statement that JNK's uh, both fortune, misfortune is its geography. It is located mm -hmm. in the in the midst of uh, three different civilizations or three different global powers. 
So uh, communities, historically also we know that, uh, you know, whether it is true that, that uh, Jammu and Kashmir was not, uh, even when uh, Ghazni and uh, tried to assault JNK, it wasn't easy. In, in fact, Ghazni didn't succeed in, uh, in Kashmir. But uh, historically also and in for future also, uh, Jammu and Kashmir will remain that, it will remain an attraction for global powers. Uh, we know that uh, the Chinese have an interest. We know that the West has an interest. And we also know that Pakistan has an interest. Uh, therefore, they will try to, they will try, they might come with new strategies, new uh, tactics to disrupt JNK. But the initiatives that have been taken by the Modi government are, uh, are exceptionally well thought out and they are strategically, uh, you can say, um, strategically well uh, uh, strategically futuristic timed and futuristic hmm. yeah uh, strategically futuristic and therefore we what we can certainly say is that that uh, they are going in the right direction but as i said it's still going to be difficult because there are a lot of global powers who have geopolitical interests in the region and that is the reason you know for last 32 years there's been a conflict uh, industry in kashmir if, to dismantle that conflict dis industry is not an easy job and uh, a lot remains to be done to dismantle that a uh, lot of people made a lot of money made their careers based on uh, because of the conflict in Kashmir, because of the violence and terror in Kashmir, uh, there's the military industrial complex, the, the arms industry, then uh, the separatism industry, you know, the, that lobby, mm -hmm. then a lot of Hawala channel, uh, mm -hmm. Hawala channel rackets, which have been operating. All those rackets and that industry was bread and butter for many people and they would uh, they would have liked to, to see this conflict going on and on and on and they might still want the conflict to go on but the initiatives that the modi government has taken um, are are uh, fundamentally fundamentally uh, paradigm shift a paradigm shift in the geopolitics of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, and they will result in uh, in securing India in the longer run. They will uh, these steps, these initiatives taken by the government in securing Kashmir will have an impact not just on Kashmir but the rest of the country as well. It will have a long-lasting impact on how this uh, nation state, how the civilizational state, uh, you know, uh, sees itself in the world and how it wants to, to rise and have a say in the global affairs, to have a say in the uh, geopolitical decisions at the, uh, you know, at the highest table of, of the world. Insightful. Thank you so much, ma'am. This is uh, Kashmir to me, as as I think you very rightly brought out, and I've I've actually said this in multiple shows that the area that is with us today, yes, but Gilgit Baltistan is today the geopolitical center of Central Asia and Southeast Asia because you got China, you got Afghanistan, you've got the Central Asians, you've got India, and you've got our best friend Pakistan also connected to that region. So it's it's kind of bang in the center, and that's why I guess this whole POK narrative keeps keeps propping up now and again. It's about mm -hmm. keeping that, I think, the foot on the pedal <laughs> as far as yeah. this game is concerned. Uh, Ma'am, thank you so much. It's such a mm -hmm. wonderful, uh, you know, opportunity.
opportunity to talk to you and i look forward actually of having another session with you sometime to discuss today uh what you brought out is a beautiful history and connecting to that history how today is going to shape uh, or is shaping in front of us would be a absolute honor to discuss with you so i really look forward for your acceptance for that particular program in the future but till then i request all the viewers to please spread this out because this has got a lot of history along with it and a uh, lot of connections that we kind of missed in our in our course mm -hmm. of studying kashmir ma'am thank you so much once again for taking out the time you, this Adi. afternoon and hoping to look for look forward looking forward to having more interactions with you till next time ma'am jai hind jai hind